Toby Kesterton. Yes. I'm Paul. Very nice meeting you. How are you? you? Very good. Thanks for coming. And you. Uh, Toby is a a leading local uh, digital uh, leader. Um, You worked at Lab. Yes. Around the corner. Yeah, I did five years walking distance from here. Yeah, excellent. Um, What did you do for Lab and when was that? So, started back, oh, 10 years ago. Yeah. But there was, they were a a digital dev house when it started. Um, and I came in as a kind of project manager, account manager, and then helped grow them out and added on the rest of their kind of, they didn't have a search arm, which yeah. was, you know, a lot of my background. Um, but they just also had a different client base and who were they talking to? And they weren't using Drupal at the time. So I was the one that introduced it there. So kind of did a radical refund from, we're going to build everything from scratch to yeah. actually open source is the way and this is how we're going to grow. Yeah. Um, so grow them out of that, and then they've got bigger and gone London side and turned yeah. dark and all that kind of stuff. As you do. As how you many do. how many um, sort of Drupal clients would you say they they would have had when you were there? Do you know? You oh. might you might not know. No, no, no. But I mean, I so background to this, I, w- I was thinking about this. I, I think I've done a hundred plus website projects. Wow. Uh, but not all over Drupal, and that's yeah. actually the point of this is that I've done quite a lot of platforms. Most of it's open source, yep. but actually more recently, there's a lot of down net projects. Yeah. Um, there's some Adobe, there's some big style sure. stuff. So actually the comparison of that, although that's Drupal is where I started, yeah. that's kind of interesting. And that's probably where I got, Brilliant. I can talk more and add more value to you Brilliant. guys. Okay, well listen, everyone welcome Toby Kesterton, please. Thank you. All right, Toby, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, Paul, thank you for you guys. Um, this is me. I'm, it's going to be, I've got 45 minutes, but it might not take that long. I'm very much going to do this as an open session. Um, I am going to invite people to heckle and ask questions, but I'm not a dev. So you can ask, if you ask me two technical questions, you will beat me and I will run away and cry in the corner. Um, but my experience is actually putting together lifestyle projects so, and comparing with markets, so hopefully that might work for you guys. Um, the bits that I'm going to talk about today, really, competition. Where does Drupal sit at the moment? What's happening in the market space? What are the big changes? Not code level, because you will beat me at this and you will know more than I do, so I'm not going to talk that level. Um, do or die, literally what's happening, what's the problems at the moment? And how can Drupal get out of that and where would we go from there? So that's kind of how I'm going to structure things. Paul did an intro for me, but expanding on that just a little bit. Over my career, I flipped between client side and agency side. So client side, I've worked for people like Mail Online and you go, oh, you worked for Daily Mail. Um, but I milked the community section and I did all of the, so some, actually some really nice travel projects and mail dating and things like that. So it's but it's big digital projects. And then agency side, done all sorts of stuff. We built a web, built a Drupal site for the NHS when they went bust in various ways. It's actually a really site interesting story, but I cropped it out for time because there's too much other stuff we need to talk about. Um, so yeah, lots of, sp- lots of interesting in big space, but typically I am running a kind of six, seven figure digital project with a dev team, a marketing team, and that kind of space. So hopefully that kind of gives you some background. Okay, everyone who just, as an interesting, just so I know, I've spoke to a few people. Who knows the people on the slide? Yeah, okay, okay. In (laughs) overlooking Greece. It's not, yeah, it is, it is, it's a couple of years old, not that bad. Um, Everyone know the other guy? Um, so actually, this is kind of my point here, is that as much as this is a uh, sorry devs, I'm going to be speaking about the political factors, the, the market factors that happen. There. So this guy is Howard Dean. He was a Democratic um, for the American Congress in 2004, and he was the guy who first did um, fundraising on the internet. Um, and he had a 51-state policy, which Obama then picked up and won, and... I look at Drupal not as a code platform, but I look at Drupal and say, what were the things that made it great? What are the things that were really was its turning points? And I point to Howard Dean and said, okay, 
yes, there's some code involved, but it was really successful because people like him platformed it and then Obama took it on and then it became the White House's site. And if you're selling Drupal, one of the easiest points in the world is to say, it runs the White House, and then suddenly people stop asking as many questions. Honestly, that's true. You know, you've got some, there's some guys in here that will talk about security level, and I will say it runs the, the White House, and they'll forget what you're saying. It's that kind of logic, okay? Bear with me, no heckles. Fine, okay. But that's, this is kind of how I'm positioning this, so if you don't like that, the rest of it's going to be more like this. I am a Drupal fan. Um, this was part of my inspiration for this talk. So I've been using this in presentation decks to clients, to internal stakeholders for years. And I mean, when I started, Drupal wasn't even on here. In fact, Drupal's never been on here because it's always Acquia because of professional services. And um, uh, Gartner has its pitch to enterprise sale sites. Drupal, as a community open source platform, never qualified to be on this thing, but Acquia did. So I think it's 2017, it appeared on here. It actually at one point overtook Adobe. So it was the number one recommended platform in the world. It's been overtaken by Adobe for a few years and Optimizely, used to be called EpiServer, has now in the quadrant. Um, and that's really, why did, why was Acquia number one and then not? Why did Adobe take it off? Why, how, how come Optimizely's in there? That, that question to me, someone who sells out, that, that matters to me. So I wanted to tell that story a little bit. Um, so that's kind of weaving into this. But that Magic Gardener side doesn't really tell enough. You've got to dive into what's the competition, what are they doing, um, how do they do. So does everyone know Built With? Common, they've been around donkey's years. Um, it's a very simple plugin. They just plug into browsers and they tell you how many sites that their sniffer picks up as running site. It's not very accurate. I don't particularly like the totals, um, but I don't particularly mind because it's the shape and scale I really care about. Are they growing fast? Are they stopping? That's what I care about, these graphs. So if, when I show you some of these things, and I'll, show you, I'll start with Drupal, that's what Drupal looks like. So you'll see it goes up to 30,000. There are more than 30,000 Drupal sites in the world. Some people say there's a million. Um, I don't really mind, but Drew built with is consistent enough. So if I compare it to other sites, what I really care about is why is it effectively stagnated and why does it look like it's going down? Um, is that specific to Drupal? What else is happening? That's my kind of, that's my thesis. Um, Joomla, by the way, very similar. Joomla, Drupal, Joomla, be around the same amount of time. Um, at one point, Drupal had about 4% of the market share. Joomla had about 3%. They're slightly lower these days, but this is roughly where they are at the moment. So what, why is it happening? What can we tell about that? Where's it going to go next? You have to start with WordPress. WordPress, biggest content management system. By all accounts, 50% of the world's content management system. But at the moment, very significantly, it has peaked. And there is definite, that is definitely true. All of the other kind of leading sites that two, three years ago, everyone thought would be going to become the new big thing. Wix, Typo, Squarespace. They're very much in the small, you know, mini sites. They're not developer led, they're pop up sites. Dropping drastically. There's something going on. Is there, have we hit peak CMS? What, what's going out there? Um, there's a couple of theories behind this, and I think we need to unpack that a little bit more. Um, there is something around the no-code bit, or the, um, the custom site. Particularly with headless sites, you can't always detect what is the system behind it. It's, it's, in fact, sometimes it's impossible to find out what um, content management system. So possibly this peak CMS is not peak CMS, it's just peak detectable CMS. Um, and that one's a kind of big caveat to put out here. HubSpot. I've actually, my recent projects just finished on HubSpot and we moved 2 million people, um, 2 million accounts over to HubSpot on a kind of um, multi-regional global property project for Lendlease. So this was the big project. So I do like Lend, uh, HubSpot as a system. Um, and what I particularly like about... 
Yeah, go, go. Yeah, go. Sorry, do you mean HubSpot as a CMS? Yes. So it's not as good as a developer-led platform. It doesn't have as many features. You, it isn't as flexible. Um, but for me, my challenge was I had regions that were doing different things in different ways, and I was trying to, frankly, get 70-odd marketers to do things consistently and actually having a single platform that had a content management system, a CRM, uh, marketing automation all in one place, that was a really big win for us. So moving, moving to HubSpot was a big win. And I mean, as you can see, as, just as a CMS platform, HubSpot is really growing at the moment, albeit at a scale that is half Drupal. But the trend lines are nice on this, and it's nice and consistent, even depending on that. Um, the weird one that you'd normally buck into this, and this is why you have to question whether vertical winners is high, is because normally you'd put HubSpot in the same bucket as a Salesforce installation. And Salesforce has Sales Cloud, Marketing Clouds, Eloqua, no, Pardo, um, variety of plugins. But Salesforce installations of content managed websites are dying fast. So there is, it's not true that vertical is going to be the way it's happening, particularly Salesforce for me is, is a bit of a Frankenstein. There's too many parts to it. It's not a singular code base. The left side does not talk to the right side very easily. It's too hard to work with. So I think putting as at saying vertical winners is a trend for the future isn't necessarily true, even if HubSpot is doing well at the moment. The other one is probably closer to your heart as devs in this room, Contentful. Does everyone know Contentful? Um, Leading for, okay, I'm going to put it out there. I think they're the leading in terms of the headless CMS space because that's natively where they started. Um, so there is a big trend, and you as developers will know more about this, but uh, Mac, Mac-based winners. So you've got proper microservices, API-first, cloud-native, headless. Is this, as a kind of next generation of platform, is this where you can be? Contentful is growing rice, but as a scale of trend, it was growing as a, as a trend line doing very nicely, but as a scale, it's only 10% of Drupal. So it's, got, it's starting from a very low base. So not necessarily this is where it's going to go, but it's one to watch. It's, in terms of trend growth and where people are going, this, this style of thinking um, is very good particularly the developers who like to have truly independent front ends. Um, anyone disagree at home? Yeah. So why would you use a product that, that, that's headless? I assume that CMS is all about managing that kind of front end. Why would you have a, a headless? <laughs> Good, okay. Uh, Do you want one in the room? Yeah. Yeah, so the point you're doing is creating an experience. Right? And there's the delivery of the experience and the creation of the experience. And very, very rarely are both experiences well handled within a given system. Right? So whereas I want lots of controls, lots of reports, lots of auditability, on the internal side of that, on the external side of that, I want it to be very pretty, very easy to navigate. So you have different competing priorities. And when you create the separation of the two, you get a hell of a lot more flexibility in what you can achieve on both sides. Um, and it, it, it has always been in the CMS world, the Holy Grail, to create that separation. Um, and I mean, if we go back to Johnny and myself, and I think if John was there when we did X faces, mm. <laughs> um, which essentially was contentful like 20 odd years ago, it, it was to do that exact thing. And for a commercial, I mean, that's explained in a dev, but for me, it's that separation. I, if I put in a brief that my front end experience is from the capabilities of my back end, I can have both. I can have my cake and eat it, is, is my better way of saying microservice based so that actually if one part fails you can keep going um, API first so that everything you know everything works together um, and cloud native is kind of 
Yeah. Can I just say one other thing? Yeah. Two different budgets. Yeah. Two very different budgets. One's the IT budget. What's That's the internal one. Yeah. The, the external is marketing. And if you don't get them playing nicely, they'll compete against each other. So the, you say it's best of both worlds, but actually the integration and making it headless without slowing down the website and slowing down the experience isn't easy from a non-technical person. <laughs> so if that's the competition, that sets the scene. Why, so why are we stagnating? What's happening in the world? It, can Drupal itself tell us something about this? So I want to speak about Drupal 7 because it has to be spoken about and Cycle XM because as a competitive change, it's done something similar that's worth diving into. So this is the announcement. When I was preparing, this is the other announcement that really pisses me off. I just, <laughs> it's just so bad. I mean, there's, it's bad for lots of reasons. One, it's, it's just lots of redundant text. It repeats itself like three times as a kind of commercial, I would just like, no, halve it, halve it again. That, you know, it could be, it could be 10 words, nine words. Um, and it just needs to go. It also, they've changed, I think if I'm right, people, you'll probably remember, they've changed this um, official end of date like three times now. So yeah, plenty of time. So why are they dragging it out? What's the benefit of dragging it out? You've actually got to hold on. So you've actually got to get people off it now. Um, so you really have to push harder and wider. But why is it important? Because that. So this is from Drupal.org. It's the split of all sites at the moment. And you've still got 50% of all Drupal sites on Drupal 7. Um, so that's 50% of all. Uh, a week ago. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you. That to me is a real problem because it says that almost 50% of the sites have either got a maintenance problem or an upgrade problem that they can't solve. But you've also got a future problem that you've got to get off that. And what? how do we get off that and what did happen? Now, it also. Why haven't they got off that? Now, as a devs, you'll tell me about the upgrade path and the fact that they did a seven to eight, which was the hardest change. They didn't, you couldn't do, it was a, um, it wasn't an evolution step. You had to do a rebuild. And as soon as you're doing rebuild, you're coming in with bold budgets. You're coming to someone like to me and saying, how do we, do, how do we restart the project? Let's start all over again. Now, actually, people who've gone to eight have gone through the stages. I was speaking to someone over pizzas who is on 10. So 10 does appear in here. There's 10.1 that's appeared off the top of my, I've chopped it off the top of my scale. But there is 3, 4% of people on 10 and 10.1 that are out now. Um, and the fact that they're, that we've gone through the stages, most people are on 9 because 10 only just come out, actually says it's healthy. But this is our problem. Why is set? Why are we on 7? How do we get out of there? Um, the other way of looking at this for why is 7 so problem is look, going back and look at Sitecore. So Sitecore, big competitor. I've done as many Sitecore sites as I've done Drupal sites, um, which is kind of odd. Lab had a .NET team and a, a PHP team, which was just odd for a dev house, but that's what we were. Um, and actually, it's the .NET team that are still, they're still based around here. Um, Cycle had this, their Drupal 7 moment. They said, going from, they went through 7 to 10 the same kind of same way, but they decided it was a, it's all commercial license, so it's not a, uh, it's not a um, open source. But they said, right, we now want to change our, license, our payment model. So it's not a license fee, it's a pay as you go model. Now you have to pay monthly, yearly, depending on the thing. Now that, from a commercial point of view, that made everyone say, um, should Sitecore still be our platform? Even if, frankly, the developers were happy with it, even if everyone else was perfectly happy to stay on Sitecore, everyone else said, oh, well, 
if you're going to change your if you're going to change your business model, therefore you've got to do a whole of market sweep. And me, like many others, did a whole market sweep. I had to tender it out to the market. I asked everyone to turn up and pitch. I asked that called turn up and pitch, and they pitched really badly. Um, but we had EpiServer come and pitch, and they went, oh, we're hoovering up Sitecore at the moment. So, um, so we had, this is the lesson from Sitecore, and if, if you look at EpiServer, EpiServer suddenly goes, whoomph. That's not really them being better. If you install EpiServer, it's still, if you, EpiServer renamed to Optimizely. If you install opti Optimizely now, it still looked like, Epi server from 2015, but they marketed themselves well. They took advantage of Sitecore, screwing all of their own customers over. The customers they've got make more money off them on a per unit basis, but they've lost a lot of customers. So there is a real problem with Drupal 7 that if you insist all customers, you do a radical change, if you do a rebuild, they won't actually stay on Drupal as a platform. It's a commercial problem, not a developer problem, but that's where we've got. Um, so, where does that take us in terms of Drupal? You've got this automatic updates thing. From a commercial point of view, our biggest problem running a site is maintenance, BAU. No one likes paying for this. Everyone's happy to pay for a new build, weirdly. It's, it's more expensive bit in terms of CapEx, but the OpEx bit's just running a dev team just to keep the lights on. Always feels bad. So. For me, Drupal, one of the things it has to take away as a learning for this is it's got to get better at how the updates, both core and modules, are run in a more seamless platform. Um, developers in the room are probably going to have quite a lot to say about that. They're going to talk about test servers and redundancy and all sorts of other problems. Um, but for me, getting that right, getting being able to do that easier and without ever having a Drupal 7 moment, key to Drupal's future. So if that's Drupal's big moment that it's still got to get over, talking about DrupalCon, DrupalCon Leal just happened, and then what happens to Drupal afterwards? How do we solve some of these problems? Sandeep's going to speak about this in much more detail than I am, but I'm going to hit on one of these issues that probably he's going to hit on, is that just before the conference, they did a big blog that said DrupalCon Europe is running out of money. And it's like, OK, let's everyone get excited about turning up. But by the way, we might not ever do this again because it's expensive. I mean, that's just not a way to sell an event. It was the, just the worst piece of marketing that you could ever do. They said, you know, we have two event organizers who are rushed off their feet. They, have, they don't have enough money, and you guys are too expensive. It was just an awful blog post. And everyone just complained at them and just said, OK, thank you for exposing all your numbers and outlaying your budget. But that's your problem, and why are you complaining about us? But it's a really weird piece of just content and you know, commercial reality. It really is as gross as this photo and the kind of Jerry Maguire moment. Um, it's still it's still on Drupal.org as a kind of as a blog piece, and they talk about it as solving the financial problem, but really, it's the business problem behind Drupal. Um, and and I picked I have stolen a couple of themes they talk about, um, but one of the others that I want to talk about is this because, and this is my point of view, and you may you, you can you can heckle me on this one because. Drupal is still solving some of the Drupal 7 problems. Actually, to me, Drupal 10 is relatively lightweight. There's a couple, there's a Symfony upgrade, there's the new type tool, there's the next version of that, but there's not something substantial in Drupal 10 that gets me as a market. I can't go into a director and say, I want a lot of money to do that upgrade. Compared to the competitor set. So, Cycle XM came out, and admittedly they changed the model, but they said, oh, by the way, we bought another business. We bought a new DAM product. We have did an entirely new way of doing search, and it's now included in the product for the same license fee. So, okay, yes, Cycle 
screwed a lot of customers, but they also came to the party with presents. Drupal hasn't, if I'm really honest. It's, there's, some, there's some minor upgrades in there. there isn't, they aren't really selling themselves to the market in any way. Um, and selling themselves as the market is what I kind of care about. So DrupalCon, the other thing about DrupalCon is there you go, who are you trying to attract to this? So DrupalCon, they're reasonably about being open with this, but I don't think they're explicit. DrupalCon Europe is for developers. There's no marketers there, there's no prospects there, there's very few agencies there. It's a dev conference. Um, Acquia, this lady is called, I have to remind myself, uh, Jennifer Griffin-Smith, she's the CMO of Acquia. Acquia do conferences in a very different way. They put on a stage, they are pitching to prospects, they have the razzmatazz, they have a, you know, they will have a video and a content aimed at universities, they will have one at universe, uh, councils. Drupal's latest developer is four years old? The latest video, sorry. That's not my headline. <laughs> Their latest video, just explaining who Drupal is, is four years old. Acrea has got videos and all the explainers and all the shiny marketing stuff that you need to have. Okay, so, yeah, I'll be happy a little bit on that. Go for it, yeah. So what? I mean, actually, I would argue I get it, by the yeah. way, and I understand the point. And by the way, I, I actually really like what you're trying to say. I like it as a point. But actually, there is a market for an open source community of developers to be able to be brought together. Yes. To talk, share ideas, communicate, collaborate, reinvent, push new features. And maybe actually the marketing issue is just simply the branding and the name of DrupalCon and what it stands for, I don't, rather than trying to be the old glossy old marketing acquia version. So I don't mind that as a total as a concept. You know, getting together Drupal to push the code base to put, solve some of those velocity problems. Yes, fine. But that at the moment it's the only conference. It's yeah. the only vehicle, and Acquia's gone off and done something different. And they and you haven't really. They are different things, but they don't, but they don't, it's not explicit enough. Yeah. What, what you're really saying is Rolls Royce run a fantastic advertising campaign. The guys that make the nuts of all the wheels are shit. Right? Because that's, that's the equivalent. Because if we don't exist without the Drupal community, without the code base, they would be the first yeah. to say that. Right? So there, I, I think the expectation that Drupal will act, and I would say it's gone too far yeah. in acting like a commercial entity, and I think that's one of the things that slow them up. I think they need to go back to their roots and go more back to being a developer-led community. So my argument here is, is that actually being a developer-led community, where's your next customer? It does, I, it, it, that, that's the, the developers are the customers. The developers are the... But who's... who's how, how do you, you actually need a CMO, a marketer, a commercial person to, to drive? I was the person that brought, yes. I, I led bringing open source into it uh, yeah. globally. I, I fought against the CIO for Northern Europe, yeah. the CAPC, all of them, right? Purely on the basis that I fundamentally believed that the technology was better. And particularly at the time I was trying to get Apache in, Jay Boss and Tomcat into the organization. And I fought for about two years, and that's what geeks do. We get stuff yeah. stuck in our head and we go back off. <laughs> so I so I think Drupal is strength is security. And if you have a tech-led conversation, you can win at that. But sometimes it's not a tech-led conversation. Sometimes it's a marketers-led conversation. What's the content experience going to be? What's the front end going to be about? And frankly, when you're pitching the front end experience, it's total fluff. But unfortunately, sometimes that matters. Sometimes there's a cost thing as well, right? So the CFO is more likely to decide Drupal's good because it's completely free in terms of licensing costs versus a site core or an Adobe experience manager. I think historically, the decision maker 
for websites has been a technical person and is moving towards a marketing person, which does make it more complicated, but it's a complicated arena. So, I mean, to give you a kind of space on the competitor, so who, what are the other conferences out there? So you look at the kind of Salesforce conference, you look at HubSpot conference, you look at Sitecore's conference. They get in the Reese Witherspoons. Matthew McConaughey was Salesforce. James Clear was Sitecore. James Clear wrote Atomic Habits, number one bestseller at the moment. Top 10 anyway. Um, but the point is they throw all the celebs at it. It's a multi-million pound event because they just want to, they need to, just, they need to be loud. And it might, to be honest, it might just be razzmatazz and it's overselling sometimes and Sitecore for its real problems, sells things that aren't ready yet from a dev point of view. Sitecore 8 came out and they promised the world because they promised it they would be done by the end of the year. Frankly, it was shit dev. But they sold it well, they had a good marketing department and sometimes you have to have some of this. And that's part of Drupal's problem, is that no one's selling it. Dev are delivering it and waiting until it's done. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have to, to, to go with Apache. Right? Yeah. Apache right? Apache's beaten all of them. Okay. It has done for the last 20 years. Okay. Right? And if you look at the Apache Foundation, you look at pretty much every single application that's launched in that, out of that kind of ecosystem. They take competition apart. Their conferences are possibly the worst anywhere of anybody on the planet. But they are very, very, even you have to agree, <laughs> they are terrible, right? Yeah. But they are absolutely pinpoint focused on who they're marketing to. Right? They are going, we, we only talk to nerds. Yeah. And year after year after year after, against competitor after competitor after better, they have won. And that's why I think what's happened with Drupal is it's got grown into the commercial world, predominantly as a result of the Acquia, early days of the Acquia influence. Yeah. And they've lost their way of it. And if they went back to the core of who they were, and they, took, they followed the Apache model, I think that's how you'd solve this problem. Because then you get the people in that can solve all these real niggly problems that people the real world problems that developers can solve if they're connected to. And and I totally agree. If if the if the defining question to whether we to install Drupal is the narrowness of it, can it do this capability? Has it got this ability to do that? And Drupal really wins. Was Drupal out of the room? Was it in the consideration set? before that question was asked, because it wasn't well enough marketed, is my, is my hypothesis. When you installed the site for it, did it run the patch? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the point. If you, if you fight in the wrong space, you will guarantee it to lose. For the key question. Yes. Um, I still think it needs to sell itself a bit better. It needs to know why it's selling itself a bit better. Um, so for me, and, and I look at Dries, and I, you know, this was Dries um, only six months ago. Um, I wasn't there, but I, I watched all of his, um, the whole keynote. Um, and to me, what I really had to ask the question, yeah, sorry, there's a, bit, there's a metaphor here, but yeah, okay, you've got it. Um, where, for me, so the, I'm putting together large, enterprise scale systems. Drupal, it, you know, is selling itself as a mid to enterprise sales platform. So I want not a CMS, I want a digital experience platform. I want integrated um, CRM, I want a, a Primo, Widen, something like that, that has, um, in my case, I think there was a couple of petabytes worth of images and videos that I could then select and it was all meta tagged and I was like, hold on, this goes into a dozen of our other systems. I want a full integration in here. Um, uh, sorry, Dan instead of CRM. CRM, I want to know exactly who the customer is. I want a native integration in a better way. I, want it, I don't want it to be able to go, yes, we can go to devs 
and say, do that, you know, I need to know what are my capabilities here. And marketing automation for me, and this was the killer for the latest project, I said, I've got 70 marketers. I want to run not only our website, I want to run our social media. I want to, um, I want our email. If I put out a launching an event, I want to put out the page, the Instagram post, and send the email all from the same platform with everyone using the same piece. So my last project, that was, to be honest, one of the driving forces for making the decision. So a deep, and I think Acquia are quite good on this. I actually really loved the fact that they did, I can't even, I don't remember who they, their dam integration with. Go on, Tom. So the dam integration is the acquisition of Widen, which is the dam product, and then they brought it in and they've recently renamed Acquia dam. So, yeah, I used to use Widen, we moved off it to a Primo, but it is that sense of scale that actually enterprise selling customers, I'm going, that's really important to me. Um, the other one, and this is what we talked about uh, a little bit, well, I was joking about it, I think. Um, I want to know the entire platform. It's not just the dev. I want to know how it's hosted. How am I going to pay for all of this? And Drupal is a bit, because it's open source, and everyone's coming together. I want to know my total cost of ownership, my service level agreements. Whether it's software as service or platform as service, I kind of need everything together. So a bit more certainty about how I'm buying this platform. That's really important to me as a commercial buyer. So I'm, no, I'm running out okay on time. We had some questions. Um, so this is me. I said at the beginning, I'm a Drupal fan. Really, having come to the end of this, I've actually realised I'm a bit of an Acquia fan. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's that professional service layer that actually I want. So, yeah, that's me. Hope you've enjoyed. Toby, you know what? You don't have to go that quick. I mean, you're like, oh, okay, you're fine. Yeah, I'll you're take like, questions. Get, get me off stage. <laughs> yeah, 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 fine. Absolutely. No, I, I thought that was brilliant. I actually like the opposing view. Yeah. And, uh, and I like the fact that you're actually coming up here going, there's a lot of challenges for Drupal, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get people, by the way, you're going to get people in Drupal who do not agree uh, a lot about lots of things, right? Yeah. Um, and that's within the deep Drupal community. And so actually, to have somebody come up, I actually understand a lot of what you're saying from a from a marketeer standpoint. It's like total cost of ownership, as you mentioned, yeah. really really big point. Um, how do I understand the whole cost of it? Very first question you're going to get, Ryan. You know, you you probably see this is like, okay, that's great, but actually, where does it sit? How does it get hosted? Uh, how do I connect it? Particularly if it's a website, uh, external sort of side. Now you know, how do you connect it to all your marketing? It's absolutely essential. So. Really good questions, really yeah. good points raised. Any any other questions for Toby? Uh, sure. Mr. Carnegie. Yeah. Um, you noticed that Drupal needs to be marketed in our platform. From Drupal's side, does it matter that they're not? Like, they don't gain money if I download their, if I download Drupal. If I make a new Drupal site now, and I know anyone who knows about it, and I haven't given them the money to do so, does it matter to them that I don't? Like with a, a paid service, like someone else would get some cash for yeah. paid, somebody else hosted it because they kind of paid them to host it. With Drupal, they're not in that loop. They may track by like, the download button once, but beyond that. Yeah, you're right. So, as a community, because it's community based, Essentially, if, if less people are using their product, the community, if it's still as thrive, is it, if it's still working, the community is still there with just less customers, it's still just as valid. I think in order to have a kind of, in order to have a future, you've got, there's the dream of growth. More customers, there's more people coming in. You, there's a belief system that just works in people that say we're going somewhere if, you, if it, if, the platform was growing. That doesn't mean the opposite's true. It just feels wrong if there's less custom. If you've got Drupal, it is better than ever, and you've got less, less people using it. Yeah, the, I think, it will I think, great. Yeah, I think the bigger question that you raised, actually, yeah. 
uh, although I love the marketing debate. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, you need to update your uh, photo on LinkedIn. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, exactly. I, I that from LinkedIn, Toby. That's, come on now. Yeah, come okay. on. Yes, okay. You, you talked about uh, the No, four, no, no, you, no, fine, I'll take that You spoke about one. the four-year-old Drupal developer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think actually you're, 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 the really more interesting and, and salient point about the, the kind of crossroads that Drupal's at is that notion of like 50% still on D7. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow. That is a big, that's an elephant in the room, yeah. not going anywhere. It'll be really interesting to see how the next 12 months plays out. Yeah. Presumably, if you're looking at, I don't know, I'm not close enough to the Drupal.org world or the Drupal Association, but you are looking at a place where basically, you know, this time next year, if that number is still at 40%, 30%, somebody's gonna have to take a decision. Guess what, January 2025, looks really dodgy at that point. Well, who's making the decisions about mo rolling these dates back? It's the final one. It's, so the announcement made in June is the final extension of Moodle. <laughs> <laughs> what, once you've made... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once you've made it three times, no one believes you. <laughs> I've got a couple of clients on Drupal 7 sites. Yeah. I had a feeling it'd be extended, so I do personally You and everybody else. So I'm probably skewing the stats slightly. Yeah. Um, but... I think the fact that they sent the final one now encourages so many people have been doing migration. Yeah. It's, a, it's a final countdown. Great song. Yeah. Great song, <laughs> by the way. Some sites that were those tiny micro brochure yes. sites that may have been better served by other platforms that aren't Drupal's ideal client anymore. And they're going to go by the wayside, and that's fine. Yeah. But I, I think it'll be okay. I, Hopefully. To me, it's the logic of delaying it. Why was the decision? pulled out why when it was 2023 originally 2025 does that is that helpful or do you need to push harder yeah anyway toby uh, thank okay. you so much toby Kesterton, everyone thank, thank you, you.